Thank you, Paul, and a very good evening to everybody here today. A true delight, as always, to come and share together. I can't think of anything I'd rather be doing than picking up God's Word and sharing it and talking together about what it really does mean as part of this cosmic conflict that we're looking at, this theme that we've chosen for this particular week, thinking about what has happened in God's universe, why are we in this situation, and most particularly, what kind of God do then we believe in, this God who makes sense. And tonight we're going to look at one of those really problematic ideas, at least I think it's problematic, to believe in a God who loves, a God who is all-powerful, a God who cares, a God who weeps over his children, and yet then burns them for all eternity for the sins of this lifetime. That seems to be, to be entirely <laughs> conflicted. Uh, it's not something that I believe would make sense. So I want to approach this from the perspective of what does hell, as traditionally understood, say about the character of God? Because if you do believe in eternal torment, as is taught by many belief systems, where do you end up? By the way, I did some research on this. I told my wife one time after I had looked into this quite a bit, I said, I think I should do a book on hell. And she said, really? Do you have to? <laughs> and I, maybe I should think twice about that. But the research that I did revealed that not only is there a Christian hell that is believed by probably 99% of Christians. There's also a Muslim hell. There's also a Hindu hell, hell. There's also a Buddhist hell. Just about every belief system seems to have a hell. Why would that be, I ask myself? Could it be that the one who rebelled there in the beginning the one that we call Satan, the accuser, the evil one, has managed to insinuate into every belief system this idea that you burn as a form of eternal punishment. Now, before anybody does misunderstand, do I believe that God does sometimes discipline us? Yes, I do. There is punishment that comes to help us to understand. And more often than not, that punishment comes as a result of what we've done as almost an automatic result, doesn't it? You know, uh, sometimes I complain that I have toothache. Why would I be having toothache? Could it be that I have a particularly sweet tooth? Who's to blame for my toothache? We have the results that come from our own actions and our own bad habits. But let me take you to some of the expressions that people have given regarding the concept of hell and why, in fact, they have rejected hell and because they reject hell as being cruel, vindictive, even, you could use the word, inhumane, unjust, that they reject God too. This is a serious problem. Here's the quotes that we have for this time. Let me just read a couple of them. Hell makes man an eternal victim and God an eternal fiend. It is the one infinite horror Beyond this Christian dogma, savagery cannot go, said Robert Ingersoll, the famed uh, critic of Christianity, who was so turned against God by a sermon on hell that his, he lived his life in opposition to the Christian message. He says, if that's the kind of person you believe God to be, I don't want to have anything to do with such a God. And we can perhaps understand why that might be. Here's one who supports it. Thomas Aquinas, the famous medieval theologian, 
in order that nothing be wanting to the happiness of the blessed in heaven, a perfect view is granted them of the torment of the damned. Do you understand what he's saying? So that you can truly appreciate the blessings of heaven, you can look over the battlements of heaven, down into hell, and see what everybody else is getting who's not in heaven. The ones who have been thrown to hell, and you say, thank you, Lord, I'm not down there. I wonder whether that's an even an appropriate kind of response for those who should be in heaven, do you think? Then's the famous song from John Lennon. Won't read that, but Bertrand Russell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly human can believe in everlasting punishment. I must say that I think all this doctrine that hellfire is a punishment for sin is a doctrine of cruelty. Another famous agnostic, even atheistic uh, philosopher. And Luther Burbank won't read it all, but his conclusion is that this idea of hell is so damnable, he says to me, that I don't want anything to do with such a God. I don't want anything to do with such a God. So where did this whole belief come from? It must have some basis in truth and in Scripture, mustn't it? If you believe certain things, you will indeed end up with a belief in hell. First of all, if you believe that you have an immortal soul, by that we mean that a soul that cannot die, that's one part of the equation. And then if you believe that God is going to punish you, that he's punitive, that you are going to pay for all the things you've done in this life, you've done all these wrong things and you're going to be punished. And if you cannot die, if your soul cannot die, then you have hell. At least the beginnings of it. It comes from those two what I would say, mistaken ideas. You can challenge me in the question and answer session at the end as to why I think those are mistaken ideas. But if you believe in an immortal soul and a punitive God, then you have hell. At least the beginnings of hell. You may then want to, I almost wanted to say flesh it out, but that's probably not the right word when you talk about hell with all the all the burnings and the devils with pitchforks and all the imagery that was created, particularly in the Middle Ages, uh, to illustrate Dante's Inferno with the various levels of hell, with the various um, torments and punishments that were supposed to very precisely address the sins that had been committed. So let's go back and look at Scripture and find out what it says about hell. If you go back and read your Bible, you'll see the word hell in there. But of course, that's an English word. It's not a word that was used in the original languages. And in fact, I would also like to suggest to you tonight that hell is a very poor word to use to translate the ideas that the biblical writers were giving. Where does the word hell come from? It doesn't even come from Judeo-Christian ideas. It comes from an alien mythology. A mythology that is a Nordic mythology, a Germanic mythology, where the dead went when they died if they were bad. They went to hell. Hell is an Anglo-Saxon word. It comes from that particular belief system. So to translate the words that the Bible uses for hell, I think, is already something of a mistake because it suggests to you that that is a, a valid mythology almost. No. What words are used in the New Testament? Hell does not occur very often. Two primary words are used. One 
is a Jewish kind of word that comes from the rubbish dump just outside of Jerusalem. That was the veil of Hinnom, often referred to as Gehenna. So, if you pick up your Bibles and look at Matthew 5, at the words of Jesus, this is even in the Beatitudes, by the way. He refers to hell three times, once in verse 22, and again in 29 and in 30. Talking about, first of all, being in danger of hell, and in the second two, it uh, talks about your body being thrown into hell. What word did he use? He used the word Gehenna. The word Gehenna, as I said, is the name for that rubbish dump outside Jerusalem. So he's using that symbolically to say, that's where you're thrown at the end, like you're thrown away into a rubbish dump. Now, there were often fires burning in the Vale of Hinnom, in Gehenna there, because people were burning up all the rubbish. Did they burn forever? No, they only burned as long as there was stuff to burn. Now, people might have kept on coming along and throwing more rubbish on and more rubbish on, and they keep burning for a long time. Are they burning now? No, they're not. So this idea of an eternally burning hell from Gehenna is certainly not valid. The other word is a Greek word that was used by the... Uh, by the ancients, by the Greek people, to describe where you went when you died. It's called Hades. You probably recognize the word. And that's just the place of the dead. That's when you go when you die, the place of the dead. You could always translate it as the grave, even. In fact, the Hebrew word Sheol means exactly that, the grave. That's where you go when you die. And Hebrew also does not know anything about an eternally burning hell that you go to when you die. You simply go to the darkness, to Sheol, to the shadows, to the grave. You may say, well, shouldn't there be an eternally burning hell to punish people? And here we come something to something that's a little more personal, maybe. Some people may say, I want that kind of thing. Not for myself, of course, but for everybody else who's bad. Shouldn't, shouldn't Hitler burn forever for everything he did? Shouldn't Stalin or whoever else you might want to name? Let me put it to you th this way. If... We don't believe in an eternal soul. What would God have to do to keep people alive in the flames for all eternity? Wouldn't he have to perform a miracle so that they could burn? I mean, and that really is probably the, one of the very worst pictures of God you could ever have. So let us put that to one side and say that really doesn't work and is not true. You can give me some other texts and I will be happy in our question and answer time to talk about them a little more. What about this idea of the fire being eternal? Is it eternal in its consequence or is it eternal in its duration. You remember the sad story of Sodom and Gomorrah, yes? And what rained down on Sodom and Gomorrah? When you go and read back in the, in the story there in the Bible, what does it say? What fire was it? Eternal fire. Sodom and Gomorrah, are they burning now? No. The fire burned until everything was burned up. And then it went out. It wasn't eternal in duration. It was eternal in its consequence. Dr. Fudge uh, wrote a very useful book not too many years ago on hell. It was called The Fire That Consumes. 
when you consume it, it's done. It's burned up. I am not saying tonight, please don't go away and think I believe in everybody being saved. There is a final end. There is a cleansing of this work. There is a lake of fire. But it's not God tormenting His children forever and ever and ever. For it's really not a question when we think about God's character of how He treats His friends, but how He treats His enemies. That's where we see the truth about God. And would you say that the eternally burning flames of hell are God disciplining His people? No, because they can never change their mind. So when we talk about hell and punishment, this is really an arbitrary and a vindictive kind of punishment by God. We have to be very clear as we think about this because if we represent God this way, I believe we clothe our loving Lord with the character of his accuser. I think the devil has done a really, really good number by insinuating this into so many belief systems. To think that God would actually do that. To actually burn his children forever. It is appalling to me. And I really don't understand how you can hold that belief. I really do think it, as one writer said, unhinges human reason. And the doctrine of eternal torment preached from the pulpit has created millions of heretics and infidels. That's what has happened. I, when I speak with people, often try to help them understand that this is something which is really incompatible with a God of love and at the heart of the cosmic conflict. I had the privilege of being in the Vatican in Rome, a guest of the Pontifical Council for the Promotion of Christian Unity. Great opportunity to go and talk with people there about all kinds of different things. And I don't know about you, would you wouldn't you like to have the opportunity of going talking to some of these folk? If you had the chance to go and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with a cardinal, wouldn't you take it? I hope so. I had the chance of doing that, and it was a great opportunity to talk about some of these issues that we're talking about here tonight. I'm talking with a cardinal. I say, you know, cardinal, it must be, don't you think it's really important to have a positive picture of God? Oh, yes, he says, that is really true. And th he was a German cardinal, as it happened. This is really true, he says. And I said, you know, cardinal, it must be so difficult to have a positive picture of God if you believe in hell. You know, you just kind of drop it into the conversation and see where it goes. Oh, he says, well, we know what you think about hell. Uh-huh, yes, we know. I thought, well, at least he knows. That's good. Then he says, but you must remember, God is not in charge of a concentration camp. I thought, well, very good answer. I told him. Excellent answer. I said, but, you know, you still believe in hell, don't you? Well, he says, as the Holy Father recently said, Hell is not so much a place, but a state of mind. I said, well, really? You might want to tell some of your members that, I think. Because they seem to still think it is a place. And he said, well, you know, we have to 
try and make sure that people see God in the best light. I said, well, that's exactly what I would like to do. But I really don't know how you do that if you really seriously believe that there is going to be eternal torment that people are going to suffer forever and ever and ever. And that led into what was just a five-minute conversation lasting a lot longer than that. A great chance to, to share together, to talk together. And I, I have often wanted to and, and have had the privilege of talking with various leaders in different churches to say, what do you do with hell? Uh, somebody said that uh, the way things are church, the way churches are going nowadays, quite a few of them are air conditioning hell. It's not such a bad thing after all. And the Church of England came out with a document some years ago where they really tried to downplay this whole idea of eternal torment. And there are, of course, some other churches react and say, no, 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 you've got to have hell. Because if you don't have hell, what reason is there to be good? That, to me, is a, a very disturbing kind of argument, especially when you read the words of Jesus. What was his message? Was it repent or be damned in hell? Or was it come to me that you might have life? Somebody once put it to me, when I was talking with them, he said, well, I accept the Christian message because it's like fire insurance. Do you understand what that means? Fire insurance, so you can avoid the penalty of hell. Is that the motivation? To want to avoid the punishment of hell so that you can like Thomas Aquinas here, enjoy even more the blessings of heaven. Well, we're going to take some question and answers now. Paul will come up. There's a few suggested discussion questions there at the bottom. We've talked a little bit about where hell came from, uh, how do modern ideas differ from the biblical perspective and so on. But I would enjoy talking with you about this very important subject so that when this comes up in conversation with people you have something to say that is significant yes thank you uh, dr gallagher for uh, explaining to us uh, from god's word some some uh, important uh, aspects if there are any questions please do not he hesitate to uh, come to the front or i uh, Either give me a piece of paper. Muni scrum om i frat kom frani. I have a question that was given to us uh, at the start of this evening, uh, Pastor. It's not directly related to this evening's topic, but still a good question. Um, in fact, before we come to it, I was just thought of something else. Mm -hmm. Maybe you want to, I remember in one of your earlier lectures, you, you touched on the subject of, of fear um, and whether fear is a good motivator. Uh, do you think perhaps that's a reason why this doctrine came into being, as it were? Absolutely. Um, thank you for mentioning that. Uh, every time I leave my book behind, and I, I feel bad about that because I wanted to mention something out from that, uh, it's on page, I think, 56, 57. There's a little section on hell and the story about Jonathan Edwards, the one who preached about uh, sinners in the hands of the angry God, that God is ready to drop you like a spider over the flame, and, and that's it. And the people in his church were so horrified that they had to hold on to the pillars because they thought hell was going about to open beneath them. They were so terrified, and they were calling on the Lord to save them. So I, I agree. I think, isn't it true that we see hellfire preaching as being a way in which preachers and teachers of Christian belief have tried to get people to do the right thing out of fear. 
Um, but as we saw with the children of Israel, how long did the obedience last? Only as long as the fear does. So, and can you really love, admire, worship somebody that you're frightened of, that you're terrified of? And almost I want to say, would you really want to spend eternity with a God who is doing that to all these other people? To the majority. Perhaps the majority, yeah. Mm. Thank you. The, the question is, is uh, and I'm going to read it verbatim, <coughs> is it a sin not to go to church even though a good Christian life may be lived by doing good and helping people in need and even praying at home? Maybe that was the, one of the reasons why they used hell, to make sure people came to church. <laughs> um, you might have had a few more people here if I was threatening uh, fire and brimstone. No, I mean, uh, let's take the question as read. Can you be a Christian and not be in church? The answer clearly is yes, but there's always a but. Uh, we are told not to forget the assembling of ourselves together. Why is that? Because it makes a difference whether we are here or not. You know, people sometimes come along to the pastor and say, you know, I really didn't get much out of, the, uh, out of church today. Uh, I, and I sometimes have said this. I'm always, always tempted to say it. I almost want to say, what did you bring? Because don't we bring something to worship? When the Israelites came to worship at their temple, they brought things. They were happy to go there, David says. He enjoyed going to the temple. Well, he wasn't in the temple, of course. He was, uh, the temple was his son who made it. But he enjoyed going into the presence of the Lord. He enjoyed that experience of worship because he was there with everybody else. We are social beings. So I'm not telling you that it is mandatory. It's compulsory. God doesn't force us. But just like somebody inviting you to their home, I think God is inviting us into his home, as it were. This is for our benefit. Um, always remember that. Our meetings... Our prayers, our praise, our offerings, they're all ready for us. God, he loves the, the experience. He enjoys it. But in that sense, he doesn't absolutely need it as a needy kind of person. So I would say, don't miss out. This is where things should be happening. This is the place to be. This is where you can come and think specifically about God. I love to be in church because I get that great sense of the presence of God. Yes, I get that when I'm out in nature. Yes, I get it when I'm at home. But the sense of being together, of sharing together, which is why church should be such a, a happy, friendly place. Because we're all together as friends of the friendly God. And if we're friends of a friendly God, then we should be friends together. Brothers and sisters. Uh, of course, sometimes brothers and sisters don't always get on so well, do they? They sometimes have trouble. So we need to work together as a family. And try and avoid all those disputes and focus on the main reason for being here. I mean, I can tell you as a pastor, you really set me off now, uh, some of the worst kinds of church conflicts happen right here. Pastor, somebody's parked in my spot in the car park. Go and tell them to move their car. It's my turn to be playing the organ today. Get that person out of there. It's my turn. I mean, we can end up being very unpleasant to each other you know we we think okay we need to treat everybody outside because they don't know the truth but if they're inside they know the truth and you know woe betide them if they don't do the right thing so uh, do we really want to be like that when we remember 
Jesus' words, what were they? This is how people will know that you are my disciples. By what? By the love you have for one another. The fact you love one another is the demonstration. All right. You're, you're prompting me to preach, so I will resist <laughs> thank, the temptation. Th thank you for that answer. And there's also the other analogy which we've often heard. It's like a, an ember, a coal. If you take it out of the fireplace and put it uh, to one side, it's not very long and it's cooled down. It goes out. And... Uh, so and if you're together, we can keep we can keep warm. Absolutely, Jacques. Evening. Hello, Jacques. Um, I've heard people say um, God will not punish you for eternity, but He will punish you for as long as you deserve, and then kill you. Um, is that biblical? And what would you say to such people? My second question is: What really does happen to the wicked at the end? All right, two very interesting questions. Um, let me just read a few verses from Revelation 14. This is talking about the end and those who worship the beast. Who's the beast, by the way? That's another term for Satan, the devil. They will be this is verse 10. They will be tormented with fire and burning sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and the Lamb. The smoke of their torment will rise forever and ever. They will have no relief day or night for they have worshipped the beast and his statue and have accepted the mark of his name. Now, doesn't that sound bad? What do we do with a text like that? And I want to turn some of these questions back to you and say, if you're explaining that to somebody, what do you say? What do you say about the lake of fire that is also there described in Revelation? There is certainly a fiery end. And it's a painful end in the sense that they don't want to die. How do the wicked die at the end? Another image that we have is Christ returns in blazing glory. How do the righteous respond? Lo, this is our God. We've waited for Him and He will save us. What do the wicked say? They call for the rocks and the mountains to fall on them. It's the same light. And it's the same light that gives life to the righteous that kills the wicked. It's the same light. It's the same glory. It's God showing himself as he is. Now, my question to you, if it's the same light and the same glory, <laughs> I almost want to use the, the phrase, well, I will anyway. Whose fault is it that the righteous live and the wicked die? Is that God's fault? Or is it because of the life you have chosen that determines whether you see that light as life-giving or death-giving. You see? This is, this is the end. Uh, your other question about for the wicked, and you know, it, it's... It's limited, the information we have in Scripture. We are told that the wicked are destroyed at the brightness of His coming. And the righteous, what happens to them? First of Thessalonians chapter 4. They are taken up to be with the Lord in the air. But is that it? What happens after a thousand years? Those who are wicked are raised again to life. And here are some other questions about the nature and character of God. If the wicked are already dead, why do you bring them back? So they can suffer some more? Is that in harmony with a loving God? Or is it part of the end time demonstration of, by God of 
every part of his judgment. Because there is this judgment, an ending, a determination. And he wants everybody to see what happens even when the wicked are brought back to life. Because what do they do? They go back up and attack New Jerusalem, the place where the righteous are, where God is with them. Demonstrating once and completely for all that nothing God could ever do would ever bring them back into a relationship with him. And at that stage, the wicked are destroyed. Maybe some live longer than others. Why would that be? Would that be God keeping them alive in the flames? I don't think so. The last one to be destroyed is Lucifer. Could that be because he's already lived in what is called the everlasting burnings? He lived in the presence of God. Maybe he thinks he still can. We're not given precise answers here. I'm just giving you some ideas that you might work on. But the image I want to give to you at the very end, when the wicked are lost, what do you think God will be, be, will be doing at that stage? Do you think he will be calling for the mass choirs of heaven to sing hallelujah? No. I believe that at the end, God will be weeping over the loss of his children. And there will be an eternal void in the heart of God for each one of those who is not there. And maybe our role, just to suggest to you a thought, maybe our role is to console our Heavenly Father and tell Him there was nothing more He could have done. Now that is a very different kind of picture than one of sending down the thunderbolts and lightning and burning people up and almost exulting in the end. And all this really comes down, the way you read Scripture even, comes down to what you think God is like your concept of the nature and character of God. Uh, somebody was asking me, well, how do you know which parts of Scripture you should take? Good question. If you went on the majority, if you read through the 39 books of the Old Testament and balanced them up against the 27 in the New, what would weigh more? if you just put them on the scale? Wouldn't it be the Old Testament? And if you added all the other things in the rest of the, the New Testament and so on, wouldn't you end up with a, a God if you did put everything on the scales that looks to be something in the nature that we've talked about of a God that is not one that you could love? There are many troubling stories in the Old Testament particularly. And there's some in the New too. The story of Ananias and Sapphira, for example. But I believe the only way you really can determine what is normative, what is the part of Scripture that is most significant, is to read and listen to the words of Jesus, who says, "'If you've seen me, you've seen the Father.'" I am demonstrating God to you. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those are the keys by which you look at all the rest of Scripture. That is describing God to us. And all the other descriptions of God, written down under inspiration to be sure, but written down by human beings, are always going to be lesser than that wonderful light that Jesus came to give us about the nature and character of God. I'm giving long answers, so I'll uh, maybe try and give you a few shorter ones. Yes, let's hear from, uh, thank you. from thank you. Uh, Andy. Uh, Dr. Gallagher, thank you for your message this, so far this evening. Mm -hmm. um, while I agree with you on your view of uh, hell, um, I was wondering how you would explain uh, the parable 
that Jesus tells in Luke 16 of Lazarus and the uh, rich man? Good question. <laughs> Let's look it up. Always read it. Always look it up. If you've got the time. Sometimes you don't have your Bible when you're talking to somebody on the bus and so on. But uh, if you have your Bible, always read it out from, from the Bible. And here in Luke 16, we have the story. And I hope you know it well, because I don't have time to go through all these verses. The story is there was a rich man uh, and, uh, who had a great life when he was here on this earth. And then there was Lazarus, who was a beggar who lay by his gate and uh, didn't have a good life. He died, and then the rich man died. And it says that they were carried by the angels to be with Abraham. First of all, my first question is, is that really what happens when you die? First question. Just a question. And then, while he's there, Abraham looks over. Uh, when he's there, he... Lazarus is at Abraham's side and the rich man looks over and sees him and says, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. Second question. Can you call from hell to heaven? Can you talk backwards and forwards? Can you reach over and put a drip drop of water on somebody's tongue? Is that literally how close heaven and hell are? Just asking a few questions as we go along. Abraham says, remember, you had everything, he didn't. Now, it's the other way around. And there's this big chasm, he says, between us. You can't cross backwards and forwards between heaven and hell. There is, it's not a metro system or anything. You can't go from one place to the other. And then the rich man says, well, please send him back to my father's home and warn my five brothers. And Abraham says, Moses and the prophets ha have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man says, no, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. What is this parable about? Is it about the final end of the righteous and the wicked? Why does Jesus tell this story? It's in the context of these parables that he's trying to illustrate. He's trying to say to them, you already have the truth. You know what reality is in the belief system. You already have all the writings of Moses. You don't need people to come back from the dead to tell you. So the story of the rich man and Lazarus is a device. Some scholars believe he was using a story that was common at the time. Um, just to illustrate. But Jesus doesn't say, this is how it absolutely is. Do you see? And there are so many other things in there that seem to be so strange that they could talk to one another, that they could even communicate, that uh, the idea you could come across, but no, that's not allowed, and so on. So I think there are so many things in that parable that show us that, this, that Jesus isn't telling something that is literally and factually true. He's using an illustration. And a parable has one point. It do, it's not an allegory. It is one point. And his point there is, even if that whole scenario happened and somebody came back from the dead, all these people here still wouldn't listen. That's what he's saying. So, are you, I mean, do you really believe that that is a, a picture of heaven and hell as soon as you die? I think you'd be very well advised not to make that the basis of your belief system when there is so much that is contrary. What did Jesus say that death is? He said it's asleep. 
And he pointed to the end time resurrection. So why does he say that as soon as they died, they went up to the bosom of Abraham? He's actually, he would be contradicting what he himself said. So I don't think you can take that whole passage and turn it into a, a picture of what happens when you die because it's controverted by so many other things that Jesus said. Okay, hope that answers your question. Thank you very much for that comprehensive uh, response. Uh, um, we have another questioner. Good evening. Hello. Um, my name's Neville Webster. And just getting back to the issue of the death of the wicked, uh, let's lay aside the hell issue. We've dealt with that. But the Bible is fairly explicit about, in the end, the, dead, the wicked will die. Now, is that, and we have traditionally interpreted that as being the punishment of God. Is there another way of looking at that? And let me just go back into the world that we know, filled with disease. And so often, you come to the end of somebody's life, they've suffered and suffered and suffered, and then they die. And, you know, that death is always tragedy. And yet, there's a blessing in it. That suffering hasn't continued eternally or for another 20 years. There comes an end to suffering. All right, taking that, can't we see the death of the wicked as part of God's mercy? After all, right back in Eden, he said, don't touch that tree of life, otherwise you'll live eternally. And would that have brought eternal suffering? Sin brings suffering. So, when God eventually says, let's bring an end here, in essence, he is being merciful to those who die. Am I... Uh, and I would agree with you entirely. Uh, I think from the perspective of the righteous is good news. Who wants to have the wicked around forever? Uh, I don't think any of us who want to side with God would say uh, an eternity of agonized sinners is anything that would be good. And as you say, we, we leave that to one side. I think from God's point of view, yes, I would agree. He says, okay, that's it. Let's finish and he sees it, it's good for everybody. I'm not so sure that every sinner will see it that way. Some may well want to say, no, I want to fight on. Maybe Lucifer says, no, I want, to, I want to keep going. And maybe that's part of the process. I'm just thinking aloud here. Maybe that's part of the process that God has to help people understand that there is no way to continue and to live apart from him. And maybe that's part of the reason why some live longer in the flames because they're still battling that idea. I'm, I mean, we don't, we're not given explicit answers here. I do like your, your thoughts and because God is merciful to the universe by bringing evil to an end, isn't he? But as I say, I'm not sure because sin twists the mind of Sinners that maybe they don't even see it that way. Maybe they see it as being something they really will fight to the very end. Yeah, there's a lot of discussion about this. Uh, we, I don't think we would say we've come to the final word. Uh, we read that at the end, every knee shall bow, right? And every tongue confess. Does that mean that everybody who's wicked says God is good? Well, that sounds like repentance. No, they don't repent. They still want to go on their own way, but they acknowledge the supremacy of God. But that really was never really under question in the sense of his power. Everybody recognized God had all the power. It's how he used the power. So um, I think we're still we're talking through some of those, those ideas. But thank you for your, for your comment and idea. Appreciate that. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
I'll, t I'll try and put it as short as possible. Um, in the beginning, the adversary accused God, and at the end, he has to be vindicated. So, God has to be vindicated. Yes, God has to be vindicated. And what is the guarantee that sin will not arise again? In my mind, that is justice, that every mind confesses and let us take Pilate or Caiaphas or whoever that uh, had him crucified, they will confess that they, will, they are wrong. And they will be satisfied because of some process in their brain. And they will see where they've gone wrong. I see God's justice and his vindication in that. Now, we connect hell or the, you said a minute ago, some burn longer than other. I feel very uncomfortable with what that could mean. Because we associate burning with pain. And I think this is how the adversary has messed up this whole idea of a loving God. I think that God will take the wicked and put them to sleep as you go to sleep without any pain. I might be making some enemies now. <laughs> the process of anguish is between their ears that they're going to die the second death we've missed out, we've lost it, we had the chance. To me, that is putting to sleep. Now somebody is dead. What did you get out of it by burning him for half an hour and making him feel the pain? I mean, that is ridiculous. To me, that is Satan's idea of hell. I see God vindicated, I see justice, I see the whole universe accepting that he is love and that he acted in love and that he puts them to sleep without any pain. But the agony is, what have I lost when I had a chance? Certainly, uh, to answer your first point, uh, your second point first, I would agree that the, the greatest pain is recognizing what could have been than what they could have had. I'm a little more concerned that the, the twisting of a sinful mind allowed to go to the end, can it still be logical? Can it really still say, after all this time, can, can Lucifer say, at the end, I was wrong, God was right? I don't know. I have a feeling that maybe he is so walked by sin, that he's not really capable of a rational statement like that anymore. I think that's what sin leads to. I think that's what we learn, that sin is, is complete craziness. And that you do no longer think in a rational way. So I don't know. Uh, here we are into the area of a little bit of theological speculation. Nothing wrong with that. It's just that we don't have a thus saith the Lord about that. Uh, and I do, but I do want to honor what you're saying in terms of making sure we vindicate the character of God. Because we need to be doing that. The universe needs to see that. And what keeps us safe? The wicked aren't here anymore. But could somebody still go wrong? Could there still be? Or maybe, maybe God takes away that ability to choose. Maybe he wipes our minds on the way into the kingdom. Remember, we won't, we won't remember anything anymore, will we? Here is where we go astray a little bit, I think, as well. No, there will be consciousness. We will know who we are. In fact, we better remember what happened because that, I believe, is the safeguard for the statement that God can make, that sin will not rise up a second time. Because we all know. And if I start having thoughts and go up to Paul and say, you know, I'm not so sure whether God is always right. He's going to say, we went that route before. Don't you even start thinking like that. That's what happened with Lucifer. Don't you remember? That kind of thing. And we're talking very much in human terms here.
the one thing that I would love you to take away from this meeting tonight is that we have nothing to fear from God even if we by our choices are not there in the kingdom. I like to tell people there's either an infinite positive, that's being there together with a loving God for all eternity, that's the infinite positive, or there's flat zero. Flat zero. Nothing. Because if you are put to sleep, to use your, your euphemism, if you die the second death, you're dead. You don't know anything anymore. You're not conscious anymore. You don't exist anymore. And in a sense, hear, hear me out here, in a sense, what's so wrong with that? You're not alive to experience. You don't know what's happening. You are completely out of existence. You, you're not there anymore. So either extreme positive, total plus, or zero. That's the choice. And when you explain that kind of alternative, yes, it will be painful to think of what you missed at the end. Yes, it will be an anguish. Yes, it will be self-induced even. But in the end, you're not there. And that solution, total plus or zero, I think is the action of a loving God who not only loves his friends, but loves his enemies too. Thank you, Dr. Gallagher. I think that is all that we have time for this evening. Uh, thank you for explaining to us, again, these uh, sometimes difficult uh, and troubling questions, mm -hmm. but uh, important for us to have an understanding of that. If you would close with a word of prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, as we close tonight, we've had many thoughts go through our minds. We may still wonder exactly what does happen and how does it happen. And of course, we wonder about ourselves. Most of all, Lord, we would like to be there, standing together with you. But we realize, too, that if we are lost, then we can even accept that. Painful and disheartening though that might be, because you are a God who will always treat every one of his children with care and love. Thank you, Lord, for being a God who does not threaten, does not force, does not rule by fear or by torture but who wants simply to bring this sad rebellion to an end so that there can be atonement once more throughout the universe as there was there in the beginning, that at one together with you, that harmony that was there in heaven that was broken by Lucifer and then brought down in rebellion to this earth. When all that is done, when all is taken away, we look forward to that great and glorious day when sin will not rise up a second time and we'll be home together with you. Thank you for this. In Jesus' name, amen.